Hello, and thank you for visiting Real Estate Financial Modeling, the premier provider of Excel-based financial spreadsheet models, financial modeling education, and financial modeling consulting for real estate development transactions of all types. In this foundation video, we will teach the basics of real estate development financial modeling. First, we are going to review our goals with this video, then we will define real estate financial modeling, identify some of the cardinal rules of financial modeling, learn about what makes modeling for development transactions unique, then take a close look at some common cost ratios amongst the various cost categories in a development budget, and finally see the relative magnitude and timing of costs in a typical development transaction. Our goals with this video are to build your confidence in your modeling capabilities, to enable you to analyze potential investments better, to increase your credibility with potential partners, lenders, and investors, and to make you more knowledgeable and valuable as a student or real estate professional. Financial modeling is the forecasting of future financial outcomes based on current assumptions. We have formatted the word assumptions in bold blue type because throughout our pro formas, as a rule, we format all of our assumptions this way so that we can easily and quickly identify which items are assumptions and which are calculations. Some of the cardinal rules of financial modeling that we have collected over the years are as follows. First, garbage in, garbage out. What this speaks to is, do your assumptions have current and reliable bases, and can you defend them? Secondly, we encourage you to annotate your spreadsheets as much as you can bear. As your spreadsheets grow from 5 tabs to 15 tabs to 50 tabs, you will be at risk of forgetting important information that determines the contents of a cell. To mitigate this, try to annotate your spreadsheets as much as possible and keep a running record of the thought processes that determine the contents of each cell. The third cardinal rule is to learn keyboard shortcuts. If you spend a lot of time in Excel, shortcuts will end up being your best friends to perform functions and format cells quickly and easily, especially when you are under deadline. The fourth rule is to save multiple copies of all of your models as you work on them throughout the day. If you save your model as a new version every half an hour, you will guarantee yourself that should your computer crash, you will never lose more than a half an hour's worth of work. Next, you should always sanity check your outputs. It's very easy to get lost in the numbers when you're working in Excel for long periods of time. What we suggest you do is periodically take a step back from your computer and ask yourself out loud, do my numbers make sense? Are my cost assumptions reasonable and are my profits reasonable given these costs? Have I timed my costs and revenues appropriately? And lastly, in financial modeling, if you have a gut feeling that you need to do something in your model now, you have the choice of doing it now or doing it later but sometimes doing that thing now is better than doing it later. Now let's talk about some modeling fundamentals. At its most basic, financial modeling is really about how much and when, and the why behind that when. When we are talking about the why behind the when, we are referring to the driver for the timing of certain expenses or revenues. For instance, if law mandates that we pay our real estate taxes in time period 3, then that is exactly when the real estate taxes are going to be paid in the model. And the when element is important, of course, because it affects our cash flow in each period, as well as our internal rate of return. Paying for items any sooner than necessary would negatively affect our internal rate of return, which is a measure of investment performance for a multi-period investment that can also be thought of as the rate of growth in cash flow that the investment is expected to generate. More technically, it is the discount rate, measured as a percentage, at which the net present value of all cash flows for that investment would equal zero. As stated, the internal rate of return is affected both by the magnitude of the positive and negative cash flows and their timing relative to one another. Let's first take a look at a very simple pro forma, or financial projection model, for an existing tenanted commercial building. What we have here are just basic revenue and expense line items, 
and the net of those two would be the pre-tax profit. For an existing commercial building that's already operating, if you were to acquire it, you will have revenues and expenses, and hopefully, pre-tax profit, all starting in time period one. However, for a ground-up development project where we are building the building and we are not operating it starting in time period one, we are going to have expenses starting in time period one, but we are not going to have revenues until some time into the project. So what makes ground-up development different is the time it takes to produce your revenues. Let's take a look at an example of a 200,000 square foot commercial office tower with underground parking. Here we have a table of the tasks and the durations required to get to the point where we are producing revenues on a development project of this nature. These tasks are listed from top to bottom in their order in the development process, and we ask for each task if we are spending money during that task, and then we ask if we are producing revenues. Even in the low scenario, we see that we have a very long runway to get to the point where we are producing revenues. With all of the time and money and hard work that are required to develop a building, and the inherent risk of doing so, you might ask the question, why bother developing at all? Well, there are a number of good reasons, and we have shown five of them here. The first is there is a shortage of high-quality real estate in the market for all uses, office, industrial, retail, housing, institutional. Second, there is capital that is seeking these types of long-term investment opportunities. Third, by developing real estate, you can spur economic and neighborhood development. Fourth, naturally you can create and reap a lot of value. And fifth, it's fun and you can put your thumbprint on the landscape through development. Next, let's take a look at a typical development project timeline. What we have done here is separated a development transaction into four main phases, and we move forward in time as we move from left to right across the screen. The first phase is pursuit or site control. The second is pre-construction or entitlement. Third is construction, and the fourth, post-construction. For the purpose of the discussion of the four phases in the balance of this video, note that we will be using a commercial office building as our example. Let's take a look at the first phase of pursuit or site control. What we mean by this is, in order to develop a piece of real estate, you need to have the right to do so. So you will have to pursue and then control, as developers say, a piece of dirt. In the course of pursuing a site, you are going to want to figure out what you can afford to pay for the site. Generally, for a development site, this is done in two ways. The first is a residual valuation, and what we mean here is you will run a financial projection model, or pro forma, by plugging in assumed costs and assumed revenues, and you will have an assumed target profit margin, and then you will back into the price of the land that you can afford to pay given those assumed costs, assumed revenues, and assumed profit margin that you have targeted. The second method of land valuation for a development site is based off of comparables, which are often referred to as comps. Comps are similar transactions that have occurred recently in your subject submarket area. So if you are looking at a downtown central business district office building site, you would talk to brokers and identify those other similar office development sites that have transacted recently and learn at what price those sites traded. And then as a sanity check, and to help you shore up your conviction, you will compare your residual land valuation and the comps and see if they gel with one another. If the most recent site traded among sophisticated parties at $50 a foot, and you're intending to pay $75 a foot, you need to be able to explain and justify that difference to yourself. For instance, is your site appreciably better located and more desirable to tenants? Did the last site trade two years ago in a significantly weaker market? 